Welcome to Muscle Force Production Part 2. As I said in the previous presentation, in this presentation I would like to focus on how muscle length is going to affect its ability to produce force. In this presentation we're going to see that muscle position and therefore joint position is going to affect how much force a muscle can produce for two reasons. One related to the ability of the muscle to produce tension, so related to the contractile properties of the muscle, but two, the, re the effect of length on the connective tissue component of skeletal muscle. So let's take a closer look at these fairly complex concepts. Muscle, um, some other physiological factors or some physiological factors that affect muscle strength is the length of a muscle. Okay, the length of the muscle is going to dramatically affect how much tension the muscle can generate. This curve or this, this, this figure here is somewhat complicated, but let me explain what that means. If we look at the blue line, the blue line is an example of how much tension the muscle can generate because of its contractile ability. So we can see this is a short muscle down here. This is the muscle long. So again, we've stretched the muscle down here. Muscle fibers are going to be able to generate the greatest amount of tension around, around the midpoint of their length. Okay, At their shortest length, they can't generate any tension at all. And at their longest length, if we stretch them as long as we can, they can't generate any tension. So a muscle's ability to generate tension is dependent upon its length. That length does not mean it's the middle of the, of the range of that particular joint. It has to do with the length of the muscle itself. And the reason for this is the muscles, remember the cross bridges that are formed between actin and myo, myosin, the proteins in the, sarco, the sarcomeres, is uh, a function of length. Near the middle of the length of a muscle fiber, we can form a lot of cross bridges. When the muscle is very long or very short, we can't generate, we can't form as many cross bridges, so the muscle proteins can't pull on each other as much. So a muscle is going to be strongest near its middle uh, range of length. So um, that's what we see in this, uh, in this curve here, the blue curve. Now, there's another part of the muscle that generates tension, and that's the connective tissue component. The connective tissue component is like a rubber band. And if you stretch it, it will pull back. Well, in the resting length of a muscle, which is shown here, okay, the resting length of the muscle, the connective tissue is not stretched at all. So it doesn't develop any tension for the muscle. As we start to go and stretch the muscle longer and longer, this connective tissue, which has elastic fibers within it, starts to develop tension, which is called passive tension. Because it's the tension like from a rubber band. As you stretch it further and further, it pulls back harder and harder. So the total tension that a muscle can generate is actually a combination of the active tension and the passive tension. So again, as we stretch a muscle further and further, even though the muscle tissue itself can't generate as much force, this tendon starts getting tighter and tighter, the connective tissue component, and we do get an increase in total tension. So the total tension follows this red curve here as we stretch a muscle further and further. So basically, uh, muscle length obviously uh, is going to dramatically affect the ability of the muscle to generate strength. Now, if we look at this picture, this is really, again, the uh, same kind of a length tension curve, but it has a little bit more detail. And it also kind of shows you down here at the bottom as to what's going on with the um, actual cross bridges and the, uh, the interaction between the myosin and the actin. So again, when a muscle is very um, long or very short, we can't form as many cross bridges. The um, term passive insufficiency is when a uh, muscle is too uh, uh, basically lengthened to be able to generate any tension. So again, that's where we would be down in, in this range, okay, where we really, the, the myosin can only form a very tenuous, maybe one or two myosin head connection to the actin, and therefore there can't be much tugging. So there isn't an ability to generate much force. It's, I don't know if you all can hear that. I have a cat and uh, she's a great cat. Um, However, she hates when I make these presentations because I could m spend my time much better petting her or getting her food, but she's yelling at me currently, but I think she'll calm down. 
So again, passive insufficiency is when a muscle is too long to form these cross bridges effectively and we see a dramatic decrease in strength. So again, we'll see when a muscle is, is at a very lengthened position, a decrease in its ability to generate force. Now, at a particular joint, uh, the muscles are typically positioned around the joint so that none of them, you know, they aren't, or sorry, all of them aren't passively insufficient at the same time. So again, some may start to weaken while others start to move into their midpoint and therefore can generate more force. And that's why sometimes this redundancy of the muscles, again, allows us to generate a significant amount of force through the entire range of motion for that particular joint. Now, active insufficiency is where the muscle is so short that it can't generate these cross bridges. You can't really see the picture uh, here as well because I have uh, my little drawing tools in the way. But um, when we look at the, the, um, this end of the curve, what we have there is an overlapping of the actin filaments, which means the myosin can't bind again with as much of the actin and generate as much force. So again, the thing that's important here is to understand that the length of a particular muscle will affect its ability to develop tension at a joint. Again, like I said, in the example of the elbow, um, the biceps is going to have its best length, its, its most optimum length for generating force at about zero degrees um, of, uh, of flexion, so almost straight. However, Mechanically, it's most effective because of the angle um, and the, the length of the moment arm, the angle of pull on the, the radius and the, the length of the moment arm of the, of the muscle is at 90. So we see a pretty good ability of the biceps to generate a large amount of force from zero to 90 degrees because of these two factors. Now we haven't talked about these biomechanical factors yet, but that's another factor. But again, we do see that again, the reason why, one of the reasons why people are strong, stronger at some parts of the range of motion at a joint than others is to some extent potentially due to this length tension relationship. The um, muscle strength also is affected by some other physiological factors like the speed of contraction. This is a little bit more common sense, I think. Basically, you can develop more force at slow speeds than you can at fast speeds. So this uh, force velocity curve is kind of a hallmark of muscle physiology. You find it in all of the texts and it looks like this. For the force of the muscle to be high, we need to have a low velocity. If we have a high velocity, if we're moving at a very high rate of speed, if the joint's moving very quickly, we can't generate as much force. So again, there's a trade-off. The faster we move, the less force the muscle can develop and vice versa. So again, the forces that we're producing when we're doing some very fast motions may be relatively small. Uh, however, uh, at slower motions, we can generate more, uh, again, more force in a given muscle. There are biomechanical factors, and we will spend uh, a whole presentation talking about some of this basic physics, um, so you don't have to understand it all now. But an important concept that we're going to learn is this concept of a moment arm. All of our joints, I shouldn't say all, the majority of our joints um, uh, involve or form a, the bones form an axis of rotation. So the motion that occurs between the bones is rotary, meaning it's in a, a circular pattern. And again, we're going to have a whole presentation on this. But when we, when we move around an axis, there's an important concept called the moment arm. The moment arm is the distance that the muscle uh, attaches from the axis. It's how far away the force of the muscle is from the axis. And a longer moment arm provides for a greater amount of mechanical advantage for a muscle. I think of it as um, if I want to move a heavy boulder and use a big long metal rod to do it, if I have a long rod, I can develop more force than if I have a shorter rod. So again, there the moment arm is longer and I can generate more force, even though I'm no stronger whether I'm using one, a shorter rod or a longer rod. So again, the moment arm is going to be an important factor in determining the uh, amount of force a muscle can produce in a rotary system. So there are a number of biomechanical factors that may, again, um, predispose a person or a muscle to be able to generate more force because of its, its angle of pull. I mentioned this on the previous slide, but what we have for the, for the biceps is it at 90 degrees, the, when the elbow's at 90 degrees, this moment arm 
for the biceps is the longest. So it ha the biceps has the greatest mechanical advantage at 90 degrees, even though it has the best length advantage when we're at zero. And that's why we can uh, the biceps can actually produce a pretty good amount of force at the elbow through a pretty large range of motion. So again, the moment arm is going to be important. Another important factor is the angle of insertion um, for the muscle or the tendon um, into the bone. And again, um, uh, that's a factor that we'll cover again later on. Generally, our body will have multiple muscles crossing each of these joints with different length moment arms at different uh, ranges of motion. Again, therefore, uh, in most cases, allowing joints to move with near maximum force through a very wide range of the, the motion that is afforded at that joint. All right, that wraps up the discussion of muscle length and its effect on force production. We have a couple other items to consider when it comes to force production, such as how aging can affect force production and some other important issues. We'll consider them in the last presentation for this series.